This is our last message in this series that we've been talking about. We've been talking about this Greek word, kaleo, which in Greek means a calling from God. And then we've been talking about the same word in Hawaiian, spelled the same, but pronounced slightly differently, kaleo, which means the voice or the sound. And so we kind of mixed those two ideas together and we created an olelo Hawaii title, which is kaleo oke akua which means the voice or the calling of God. So back in week one of this series, we said that of all the things God calls all Christ followers to do, the first one is that he calls all of us to care. We said that to say we care and not to act is not to really care at all. And then we said the second thing that God calls us to do is to worship. And we said that inherent in that word worship means to bow down or to kneel down, to fall down before God. In the third week, we said that God created or called all of us to serve Him and to serve other people, to serve within our church family. And then last week, we talked about how God has called all of us to make disciples. So this week, we're going to talk about the fifth thing that God calls all Christ followers to do. God also calls all of us to be holy. So if you're filling in notes this morning, that's your first fill-in, I think. Be holy. God calls all of us to be holy. So when we look at Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we see that God consistently calls us to be holy, to practice holiness. 1 Peter chapter 1 is just one of many similar examples. He says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Then in Hebrews 12, 14, we read a very serious statement. The author of Hebrews says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. And then he says this, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So I want you to think about that for a minute. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So I think it's pretty obvious then that it's very important for us to understand what holiness is and how we are to practice it in our lives. But in order to talk about holiness, the holiness of God today, first I need to talk a little bit about music. Because I love music, almost all music. Old school country western isn't a favorite of mine, and and rap, uh, most rap I have very little patience for. But other than that, I have very eclectic music tastes. And of course I love to sing, you know that, I always have. And you know by now that I like to sing you some songs like the piano man, sing you some songs tonight. I like to sing about sweet home Alabama, right? But I like to rewrite the lyrics and sing sweet home up in heaven where the skies are so blue, sweet home up in heaven, Lord, I'm coming home to you. That would have been a better way for them to write that. I like singing along with Taylor Swift because the play is going to play, 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 and the hate is going to hate, 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 but I'm just going to shake, 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 shake it off, shake it off. I look just like her, don't I? (laughs) When it comes to music, though, here's what I really love to do. I love to sing songs that are love songs to Jesus, and I love to sing songs that point other people to the love of Jesus. I love the old hymns, songs like Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I love to sing great modern praise and worship songs like, This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Of course, backed up with drums and electric guitar and bass guitar. That would be so much more fun to listen to. And we'll get there next year. We're going to have that. So Victor Hugo said this about music. He said, music expresses that which cannot be said and on which it is impossible to be silent. Here's the newest member of our church here in the center aisle. She was here all morning at the first service, little kitty cat. She's very dear and precious, and she's going to distract you from everything I'm saying the rest of the morning. (laughs) Plato said, music is a moral law. It gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and charm and gaiety to life and to everything. 
And then I would put it this way. Music is a gift from God that captures and carries emotions that just can't adequately be expressed by words alone. God commands us to use music and to sing for His glory. And the Word of God has a lot to say about music being created by God for God. One passage is Psalm 98.4, which says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Our God loves music. He created music. And in fact, our God is a great singer. Did you know that? Did you know that our God sings too? Scripture says He does. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In His love, He will no longer rebuke you, but, listen to this, will rejoice over you with singing. Our God sings. So you know what the first recorded song in the Bible is about? I'll give you a hint. The last song recorded in the Bible is about the same thing. Kind of interesting, isn't it? The first song in Scripture appears in Exodus 15. The last song can be found in Revelation 15. And both have as their shared focus praising the holiness of God. So we go back to Exodus 15 and we see the Israelites who have just made their successful exodus out of Egypt, out of slavery. They reach the other side of the Red Sea. And Moses has led the whole nation of Israel there, and now he leads them in a song that celebrates the holiness of God. The lyrics of that song are recorded for us in Exodus 15, but the melody has been lost to antiquity. And so whenever I encounter songs in Scripture that I don't know the melody to, I just kind of make up my own. And so maybe I think that song might have gone something like this. I will sing to the Lord, for He is highly exalted. Both the horse and the driver He's hurled in to the sea. Could be, right? I mean, it could have gone like that. One verse really captures the entire gist of the song. It's in verse 11, and I'll just read this one. He says, Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? And then these phrases just really catch my eye. Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. And then we get to the last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ given to the Apostle John, and we see another song about the holiness of God. John tells us he looked and he saw something like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. And they held harps given to them by God, and they sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed." And then, of course, in between Exodus 15 and Revelation 15, God's holiness comes up in Scripture again and again and again. And this word holy is used more often as a prefix for God's name than any other adjective in Scripture. We look at the prophet Isaiah and we look at John, two men in Scripture who were permitted to see into the throne room of heaven and they were able to write about it. And both of them reported hearing one continuous refrain being sung there both day and night. Here's what they heard over and over. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We have a great old hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We're going to sing that at the end of worship today. And then Chris Tomlin and Louis Giglio, they wrote a great song inspired by this verse as well. They sang, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy, holy, holy. It's the only attribute of God that's repeated three times in a row like this in Scripture. And so this morning, I believe God sent me here to share something with you. And what He wants me to share with you is so mysterious, it's so disquieting, it's so awesome, that when I find myself pausing and fully reflecting on these truths about God's holiness, I'll be honest with you, it makes me tremble a little bit. It's a little bit overwhelming when you stop and really take in who God really is and what the holiness of God 
really means. It reminds me of a song by Big Daddy Weave that goes like this. Oh God, I see the work of your hands. Galaxies spin in a heavenly dance. Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I hear the sound of your voice. All at once it's a gentle and thundering noise. Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. So let's ask this question. What does the holiness of God really mean? Let's ask this question in a day when God is so commonly ridiculed and dismissed and just outright ignored by so many in our culture. Let's especially think about what this word holy really means and what it really has to do with us. What does it mean when we say God is holy? Well, that word holy, it actually has a double focus. So let's talk about each of them for a few minutes. The first focus of the word holy is To be holy is to be distinct, to be separate, to be unique. That's your next fill-in if you're taking notes this morning. To be unique. It's connected to the word sanctity and sanctify, sanctified, sacred. All of these words come from the same root, and it means to be set apart, to be totally different, to be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other, holy other than everything else surrounding you. And so when we say God is holy, we're not just talking about one characteristic out of many about God. We're talking about the very character, the very nature of God himself. Holiness, when it's applied to God, means that he is utterly unique. He is incomparable. He is matchless. He is without parallel, without peer. We read Isaiah 40, and we see God himself issuing this challenge to us. He says, who will you compare me to? He says, who is my equal? If we're honest, we have to answer, oh, Lord, there's no comparison. You are indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All-powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim You are amazing, God. God's just not a supersized version of you or me. He's not just a way better version of you or me. He is transcendently separate. He's in a class all by himself. God is subject to no one. He answers to no one. He is subject to nothing. He has always been and he always will be. He is not subject to the limitations of time or space or energy because he created all of those things. He is holy, holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, holy. These are the attributes of our God. This is who our holy God is. So all through Scripture, we have accounts of people who encounter God. And in this moment of revelation, when they see Him for who He is, when they finally grasp the infinite holiness, the complete uniqueness of God, they were undone. They were overwhelmed. They were full of fear and awe. They were experiencing a being who was so beyond their description, so beyond understanding, so different from everything else they knew in their life that they were immediately full of fear. That was their first reaction. And so this is the first focus of the meaning in the Bible about the holiness of God. He's not like anything or anyone we can possibly come up with. We pale in our description of trying to describe who he is and what he's like. He's so far above us. He's so far beyond us. And he tells us this himself through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. God is so holy. He's so completely different and so rare and so glorious and so awesome and so magnificent that no one in the Bible, regardless of how devout they were or how learned they were, they all failed to, they didn't fail to crumble in fear and in humility and in repentance when they caught this glimpse of this holy God. We'll read a couple of examples. When God met with the uh, prophet Habakkuk, 
Habakkuk describes his reaction like this. I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. He was shattered by what he saw, full of fear. Isaiah in the throne room of God reacted the same way. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The Apostle John reacted the same way when he was confronted with his vision of the risen Christ. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. See, when we see God for who he really is, holy, 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 it kind of traumatizes us because we immediately see ourselves for who we are in comparison to him and who he is. <laughs> and the disparity, to say the least, is overwhelming. In multiple places in Scripture, we find this proverb, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now that word fear, that's one we often try to water down in the modern church. We don't want to fear God. And so we say, oh, that word fear, it doesn't really mean fear. It means respect and awe instead of fear. And while it's true that God wants to be a loving father to us, God wants to be a friend to us, sometimes we go too far with that characterization. There are people who kind of portray God as being just one of the boys, somebody I can hang out with, confide in, call on when the going gets tough, regardless of my relationship with them or what kind of life I'm leading, what kind of sins are still oozing and seeping through my life. But that's not who Scripture says God is. I heard one pastor refer to God once as Jesus' old man. Now I'm all for using the gospel with pulp culture references to, to kind of help people grasp who God is, but dumbing God down in that way goes too far for me. God says this in Psalm 50, You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you in pieces and there will be none to deliver. God says it's a dangerous thing to forget that God is holy. Deuteronomy 4.24 reminds us, The Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Third day sings a song about that. It says, Now I'm in the presence of Almighty God, and yes, our God, He is a consuming fire and the flames Burn down deep in my soul, yes, our God. He is a consuming fire and He reaches inside and melts down this cold heart of stone. So let the mystery of who He is strike you deeply today. God doesn't fit into our neat little theological ideas and boxes. He can't be defined or contained by our finite minds. His way is not just one way of a hundred equally valid ways to consider. He is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, H-O-L-Y. He is holy, entirely, completely other, separate, above you and me. We are not His equals. We are simply the finite creation of our infinite creator. Now the second word, the second focus of this word holy, it has a purely moral focus. We know that God is the creator of morality. God is the designer of and the definer of what is right and what is wrong. There is such a thing as absolute truth and absolute right and absolute wrong. All morals are not fluid and they're not individualistic. God says no, there is something that is holy and there is something that is not. So holy, to be holy, is to be absolutely pure. Pure. The sacred nature of holiness that we've talked about before otherwise applies most specifically here in purity. Holiness is being set apart, separate from anything that's impure in order to be given completely over to what God says is pure. And so when you apply this meaning to God, His holiness points to what 1 John 1.5 says. John says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Puritan pastor Stephen Charnock many years ago referred to this verse and said it this way, as there is no darkness in his understanding, so there is no spot in his will. As his mind is possessed with all truth, so there is no deviation in his will from it. He loves all truth and goodness. He hates all falsity and evil. 
The Apostle Paul reminds us of this holy nature of God in Romans 1.18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, talking about the wrath of God, that makes many modern Christians nervous. We prefer to focus on the love of God. But in the course of doing that, many make the fatal mistake of assuming that God's love for us makes Him unwilling to punish sin. Worse yet, that God is okay with or even loves our sin. But don't be deceived. God does not love or accept sin. He is holy, and He calls us to be holy as well. Theologian Jay Packer wrote these words, God's wrath in the Bible is never the capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, morally ennoble thing that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. Now, most of you have known me long enough to know I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher. I was ultimately won to Christ by the realization of the love of God, and that's always been a major emphasis of my preaching and teaching over the years. But we don't want to do that to the extent that we overlook the holiness of God. So often in our world, we ignore this, and we present a worldview of God that's kind of like just a doting old grandfather on the front porch who just nods in approval of anything we say or do. He's just proud as punch of those darn kids, right? Our culture has erased the idea of morals and sin. And more and more, we are the, if it feels good, then it must be okay with God generation. And the God just wants me to be happy generation. Almost any and all sins can now be justified by a people and a culture that has fully subscribed to this way of thinking. Well, if I enjoy it and it makes me happy, then how can it be wrong? And how could God ever hold it against me? Because God just wants me to be happy. As long as I'm happy, God's happy. The Bible never presents a God like that. The Bible consistently presents a God who has established moral right and moral wrong. A God who has established what is a sin and what is purity. And he calls us to reject the things that he has called sin and to embrace the things that he has called purity. The Bible is very clear that this God of ours hates sin. He doesn't hate sinners, but he most definitely hates sin because he hates what sin does to the people he loves. Now here's what the Bible tells us. The day of God's wrath against sin is coming. All sin will one day be destroyed. And if we are people who choose to embrace sin, sort of wrap ourselves around sin and make ourselves one with it, then despite the repeated warnings and incredible patience of God, we will experience the wrath of God as well. If we are willingly intertwined with sin, when that sin is fully judged by the holiness of God, we will be judged by God's consuming fire as well. Scripture is very clear. It says neither sin nor people who are willingly embracing sin will be allowed in God's eternal kingdom. This truth presented in Scripture over and over and over again is unmistakable. And all that brings me to my final point this morning. It's the point I started with this morning. That scripture that says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The prophet Isaiah reminds us of this in Isaiah 59. He tells us, your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God. And your sins have made him hide his face from you so that he does not listen. Psalm 24 tells us something similar. It asks, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And it gives us the answer, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not set his mind on what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord, the righteousness from the God of his salvation. So we put all that together and the Bible is very clear. It is ultimately only the holy people who will see the holy God. Unholy people will never lay eyes on him. So we stop and say, well, then what hope do we have? Because I'll just confess to you this morning, God is holy, but I'm not. I'm better than I used to be, but I have so far to go. I'm not even close. Fundamentally, essentially, by nature and by choice, I'm still a sinner. I sin way less than I did 20 years ago, but I'm not perfect. I'm not even close. I'm just pursuing holiness in my life, but I'm not yet holy. I still daily stumble and fall in my attempts to be holy, to live a life that's holy and honors God. 
1 Peter 1 tells us, As obedient children, don't be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So God commands us. God calls us. He's given us a kaleo to be holy because he's holy. And I want to be holy, but my life is not holy. My heart is still sometimes attracted to sin. My mind still tries to justify sin. And I find myself being a living contradiction to God's holy character sometimes. And God sees all. So I'm caught red-handed and so are you. Our sin not only makes us totally incompatible with our holy, holy, holy God, Scripture says it makes us guilty of treason. We've broken His law. We have defied His commands. We've fallen short of His glory. We've trespassed in forbidden territory. We've missed the bullseye of perfection that is required by a holy God. So we deserve death. We deserve destruction. We deserve eternal separation from our holy God. And the Apostle Paul, he can really relate to this. He writes in Romans 7. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. He says, as it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. Paul says, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, (laughs) this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So Paul puts it all together. He says, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. And then he cries out, what a wretched man I am. (laughs) What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Can any of you relate to that? Boy, I sure can. A constant war rages between the desire to do what's right, to live a perfectly holy life, and the desire to indulge the flesh, to follow my ways instead of God's ways. And so as he confesses his lack of holiness, the Apostle Paul cries out, What a wretched man I am! Who can rescue me from this? And thankfully, he immediately gives us the answer. He says, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here's the good news of the gospel. Here's what Christianity offers us that no other faith in the world can offer. Thankfully, what God's holiness demanded, His grace also provided through Jesus. Let me say that again. What God's holiness demanded, His grace also provided through Jesus. So here's what happened. Jesus stepped in and took the white-hot heat of God's eternal and holy revulsion to sin. Jesus became our sin on that cross on Calvary so that everyone who puts their hope in Him will never be put to shame. Here's what happened. On the cross, Jesus and I traded places. Jesus and you traded places. He became our sin and we became His holiness. So as imperfect as we are, We are now allowed to stand before God in a righteousness that is not our own, but a righteousness that belongs to Jesus. But he's granted the credit of that to us who follow him. We've been given forgiven, accepted sonship, daughtership with all of its privileges. So God the Father sent his son, Jesus, to take the punishment for our sin so that if we will place our faith in Christ, accepting his way, following Christ, not just in name, but in deed, actually following Christ, then he'll fill in the blanks of where we continue to fall short in our pursuit of holiness. And this is great news for all of us because we all fall short. Romans 3 reminds us of that. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. He says there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. And the Apostle Paul also points out just before that passage in Romans 5 that as we all struggle and stumble in our attempts to live holy lives in Jesus' name, God continues to show us more grace and more mercy. It seems sometimes like the more we sin and the more we stumble, the more grace and the more mercy and the more patience God shows us. He's so patient with us and He doesn't immediately punish us for our recurring sins, our repeated falling short of the glory of God. So what does all this mean, Paul asks? Since Jesus has fulfilled the requirement of God's holiness in us, Are we then free to go out and just commit all the sins we want to, to our heart's content, without any fear of reprisal from God? Have we somehow found a spiritual loophole that allows us to live as though we have no relationship with Jesus, no responsibility to be holy as He is holy? That if we just go out and sin and sin and sin, God's going to give us more and more grace. And so, hey, you know how we can experience the most grace? Do the most sinning. That's the way some of the people were thinking in Paul's day and age. Some of the people Paul encountered were trying to make this very point, essentially saying that sinning was okay with God. So sin all we want, and God will forgive all of it because He just wants us to be happy. The more we sin, the more we'll experience God's grace, so keep on sinning. Now here's Paul's response to all that in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He says, by no means. Some translations say, may it never be. May that never be the case. We are those who have died to sin, Paul says. How can we live in it any longer? Here's another part of Paul's answer to those people in Galatians 6. He says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. What's he mean? In other words, when God points out a sin in your life, when you become aware of some aspect in your nature that is unholy, that is displeasing to God, and by His Holy Spirit, He convicts you, He gives you a kaleo, a calling to change it, to repent of that sin, then you need to obey and you need to repent because we're supposed to live a holy life, a life that is uniquely set apart for the glory of God, and a life that is pure and without sin. And so if we're really going to be followers of Jesus Christ, not just in name, but in deed, we have to obey when God convicts us. We have to repent. We have to pursue holiness because our God is holy, and He will not be mocked. When we're truly followers of Jesus Christ, the proof is in our actions. We do what Jesus would do. We act the way Jesus would act. We speak the way Jesus would speak. We treat other people the way Jesus treated other people. We obey God. We reject sin. We do our best to live holy lives just as our master led a holy life. Now, God knows we're not going to reach perfect holiness in this life. If we could do that, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to come and do what he did. We could have done it ourselves. And yet, living a life of perfect holiness, that should still be our constant focus, our constant effort, our constant goal, because we're called to be holy, just as He is holy. We're called to do our very best and trust Jesus to fill in the rest. So let me conclude by asking you a very serious question this morning. Is there anything that the Word of God calls a sin that you are still practicing in your life right now. And it might be something you really enjoy. It might be something you're really good at. It might be something you really love. And it may feel fantastic to keep doing it. You don't want to give it up. You don't want to stop. But God says stop. And you don't want to. Well, that's the destructive nature of sin. Like any addiction, it deceives us. It convinces us that it's worth whatever it costs us in the rest of our life, even if it costs us eternal life. But God is giving us a kaleo today, a calling to obey Him, to leave our life of sin, to repent of all behavior that He calls sin, to pursue holiness. And the problem is we've been seriously deceived by our our culture. There are preachers who will tickle us with what our itching ears want to hear. And we've been told that we can call Jesus Lord but we don't have to obey what he says. You can just call him Lord, 
you don't have to obey what he says. But Jesus was very clear. Calling him the Lord and Savior of your life isn't enough. He demands more than just lip service. He tells us clearly in Matthew 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So if we'd ask ourselves this question, who's going to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, Jesus already answered that question. Only the one who does the will of God. So what's that mean? It means going to weekly confession, that's not a get out of hell free card. Saying the sinner's prayer, that's not a get out of hell free card. It's not a license to continue in sin without fearing any consequences. We're called to be true followers of Christ, the ones who actually do the will of His Father who is in heaven. That means we're to be pursuing holiness in every area of our life, rejecting sin, fleeing from sin, doing our very best to live holy and then trust Christ to fill in the rest with His grace. So if that's where you're at, then a prayer that you would want to sing is something like this. You'd pray to God, and you are holy, 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 all heaven cries holy, holy God, and I want to be holy, 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 I want to be holy like you are. Would you pray with me, please? Father God. That's my prayer for each and every one of us here today, Lord, that we would ask your Holy Spirit to shine your light in all the darkness of our life, God. Point it into every closet, every drawer, every nook and cranny, every corner, every basement, every attic of our life. Shine your light and show us all the things that are not pure, all the things that are not holy. And give us a clear calling, a clear kaleo, to walk away, to flee from, to reject those things, to repent of those behaviors, and to live differently, to truly follow you as our Lord and Savior, not just in word, but in deed. I pray for everyone here who has maybe never begun a relationship with Jesus in the way that I've described it today, to say, Jesus, I believe you're who you say you are and that you'll do what you've promised to do. I believe that you went to the cross willingly to pay the debt for all of my sin, to become my sin on the cross and to put its power over me to death, to give me the opportunity to be considered righteous and holy before your Father because you are righteous and holy. You, you give me the opportunity to be counted as your team even though I haven't earned the privilege myself. Jesus, you have promised me that if I'll follow you, if I'll trust you to make payment on all of my sins, and if I'll do my best to follow you, you'll fill in the places where I stumble and fall short. But help me be a true follower of Christ, not just someone who says the words, but someone who actually does it. Help me do the will of your Father in heaven. If that's the prayer of your heart today, you could just say, me too, God, me too. Help me be a true follower of Jesus. Lord, help us. Have the hope of eternal life when this life is over and help us live the fully abundant life of a holy Christ follower in this life. That's my prayer for every one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen.